We were working across from each other, and she was gorgeous. I mean, there were a lot of people that worked there, but not that looked like her. And uh, I was looking at her, and then our eyes met, and our eyes weren't supposed to meet because I was not ready for our eyes to meet. And guys, for those of you who, who are single and you're looking for a relationship, there's a very fine line when your eyes meet between having a conversation and being a creeper, and so you better be armed with something. <laughs> you, listen, this is just, just Uncle Brian helping you out in life, all right? You better be armed with something to say, because if you just stand there, like, you're a creeper and your chance is gone. <clears throat> It's like, I like your shirt. <laughs> I'd look for excuses to, to go talk to her, make small talk. And then I got to know her a little bit. And there are a lot of pretty girls out there, but this one, she was really nice to people in a service business. And if you've ever worked in a service industry, you understand that sometimes that's easy and sometimes that's really challenging to be nice to everybody. But she was. She was nice to everybody. And she had a smile that lit up the room. And then I found out that she loved Jesus. And I was like, this is it. So I walked over one day. And I said, I think you're gorgeous. But you're also really nice. You have a beautiful smile. And I've heard you love Jesus. And that's not a combination you find all the time. So I'd really love to take you to dinner sometime. And she looked at me and said, no. Now, a lesser man would walk away defeated, but not I. I was going to make her feel bad. And so I looked into the eyes of my future bride and said, fine, I'll go take the walk of shame. And that's exactly what I did. And I walked away. And then six weeks later, one of her coworkers came up to me and said, I think you should ask Brooke out again. And I said, you have a really sick sense of humor. No, thanks. I'll pass. And she said, no, really, you should go ask her out again. And so this time, like a creeper, I followed her out into the parking lot. Because if you get shot down once, that's fine. You tried. If you get shot down twice in front of people, you're just a sad story. And so if that was the case, I just didn't want it to be on a wide scale where everyone could see. And so I followed her out into the parking lot. And I looked at Brooke and I said, this is the last time I'm going to ask, so you better say yes. Let me take you to dinner. And she said, all right. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. And here we are now. You know, there's certain moments in life that change the course of your life. Sometimes you know those moments are coming. A wedding, you have time to pr prepare for that. A graduation, you have, you have years looking forward to this date, and you know those events are coming. Sometimes moments change your life that you have no idea are coming. In an instant, everything can change. In a car accident, or you go to a doctor, and all of a sudden you're diagnosed with something, and it's very sudden. Certain moments change everything in our lives, and certain moments change not just our lives, but they change the trajectory of others' lives as well as our own. And this morning, we're going to look back in time a couple thousand years to a conversation between friends. But this was no ordinary conversation. This was a conversation that would change the trajectory of everyone's life in the conversation, but it would also change the trajectory of everyone's life who would follow this conversation. It was a conversation between two friends. One is Jesus, and one is Peter, one of his closest friends. And so this morning, we're going to look at this conversation. If you have your Bible apps, you can follow along on your phones or tablets, or if you have your Bibles with us, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start this morning in verse 13. If you don't, the verses are on the screens right there. As we look at this conversation between Peter 
in Jesus. And what we're going to see are a couple things. The first thing we're going to see is a universal question that's not just asked of Peter, not just asked of Jesus' other friends, his disciples, but is asked and must be answered by every single one of us. It doesn't matter where you line up in terms of, of spirituality. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your spouse answers. It doesn't matter what your kids answer. It doesn't matter what your parents answer. Every single one of us will be asked this question, and an answer is demanded of all of us. And this is what we find. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is. So Jesus has just done some incredible things. He's been doing miracles. He's healed people. And there are people from a religious background who aren't excited at all about what Jesus is doing because Jesus' ministry looks different than they think it should look. People aren't prepared for this. They weren't ready. And so Jesus hears all the chatter. He knows what's going on. He understands that, uh, that people have different perspectives of him. And he's trying to see what his disciples feel. But understand this question that he asked his disciples, in who do people say that the Son of Man is, is the most important question that you will ever have to answer. It is more important than who you'll marry. It's more important than what you'll do for a living. This is the single most important question you will ever have to answer. And an answer is demanded of you even if you don't realize or understand that fact. And so his disciples answered. And they said, well, some say John the Baptist. And others, they say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. They're having flashbacks to when they were in grade school and, and they were asked a math question and they did not have the answer. The teacher, she's drawn on, it used to be a chalkboard, now it's a smart board, they don't even have to write anymore. She's just typing on her device and then she turns around and the whole class is just gazed, gazed over what she's talking about. They're all staring out the window because they don't have a clue anymore and all of a sudden your daydreaming is stopped instantaneously when she asks you out of every one in the class what the answer is and so what do you do you hedge your bets and that's exactly what the disciples did here they try to answer there's this nervousness like jesus says he wants an answer from them he's demanding an, an answer from them so they've got that nervousness and then they offer a politically correct answer. Well, other people, they say you're John the Baptist. And, and other people, Elijah, and other people, Jeremiah, other people say you're a prophet. That's what we're hearing. You ask, who do, who do people say? So that's, that's what we're hearing. This, this, there you go. But here's the thing. Jesus isn't concerned about others. He's concerned about them. Jesus isn't concerned about others. He's concerned about you. This is what's one of the things that is so incredible about God. Is that he is concerned about us individually. And Jesus said to them, what about you? Not what does everybody else say. What about you? Who do you say? that I am. And this is the moment of truth that we all will face regardless of our socioeconomic background, regardless of our own personal beliefs, regardless of our upbringing. This is the question that is demanded of every single one of us. We all must answer, who is Jesus? It is the universal question that is demanded of all. Listen, let me reiterate this. It doesn't matter what your parents answer. It doesn't matter who your spouse answers. It doesn't matter what your kids answer. You're on your own. 
and an answer you must give. This is the question that is demanded of you as it is me. Who is Jesus? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Peter nails it, and he answers, We understand, Jesus, who you are. You're God. And Peter here just demonstrates this this most incredible thing about God, that he's not some distant, disconnected deity. He is concerned about the answer of Peter. He is concerned about the answer of his other disciples. He is concerned about my answer. He is concerned about your answer. In an age in which we live, that if you have a problem with a business, you can't even get a hold of somebody in the business to tell them the problem. Their entire customer service strategy is to get you to get so frustrated, either arguing with a bot in your chat window or else hitting zero and one so many times on your phone, you're just yelling at them. And in a blackout of rage, you hang up the phone or you slam your laptop shut because you're so mad. And the business is excited about that because they don't actually have to deal with your problem. In an age in which you can't even get somebody from a business that you send money to to address your concerns. We have a God who is concerned about us individually on a personal level. Don't miss it. God is available to us. This is the reason that Jesus came is to restore us to a God that we had rebelled against. And the religious people of that day, they didn't understand it. Because they thought it would look different when God showed up. But God loves you. God is concerned And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is so excited by this answer that he pulls out Peter's full name, right? Remember when you're a kid, you know you're getting your full name under two occasions. Number one, you have ticked your mother off, like she is, she is Christian cussing at you, all right? She's making up new, new combinations of words. You don't even know what they mean, but you don't want to stick around to find out because you have just seen rage like you have never seen before. And there's like a little spittle that's flying out of her mouth. And what always fascinated me as a child was I would see this often from my mother. She's a lovely, God-fearing woman, but I would drive that woman crazy sometimes. And she would just be like, Brian Todd Persley, get in your room. The phone would ring. Hello? Every mother is bipolar. The second (laughs) second half phone rings, they're a brand new person. That person on the other end of the line had no idea she was within a moment of ending my existence. (laughs) No idea. Everything was fine in the Persley home, according to them. She'd hang that phone up, and it's like she didn't even miss a beat. Just wait till your father gets home. I'm not even going to wait till your father gets home. I'm like, oh, you're back. Like, it's very confusing as a child. It's very confusing. Which mom do I have right now? So you know if you royally screw things up, you're getting the full name. Or if you do something that's really good and they're really excited. So Jesus here, he calls Peter by his full legal name. He's so excited by this answer. And then, based on the understanding that Peter has demonstrated, that Jesus is God, he introduces a brand new concept the very first time. 
That was a plan of God all along, but it's the very first time. This moment changes everything for us. This concept and idea of the church is introduced. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So you understand the church, it is built upon Jesus and those that follow him. Jesus is the focus. Jesus is the foundation. But years later, Peter would write a letter, and in that letter, he would play off this because this moment changed his life and it changes all of our lives for those of us who follow Jesus as we understand this concept and this idea of the church. Years later, in a letter that Peter was writing, he would talk about how those who follow Jesus are individual stones who God takes and makes something glorious. Jesus says, on this rock, I'll build my church. And years later, when Peter writes his letter, he's started to experience that. And he's never forgotten this picture. He's never forgotten this conversation. And hell, the gates of hell, will not prevail against it. Hell will not defeat this entity. Hell will not be victorious. Now, I am I'm a movie aficionado. I am personally responsible for driving movie pass to the brink of bankruptcy. And if you have movie pass, I'm really sorry about all the changes you've experienced recently. But that's because I got the annual plan and I'm under a dollar a showing right now because I've seen over 90 movies in the last year. I am a movie freak and I love I love war movies there's just something about war movies that I love where you see a group of people who go into battle and do heroic things and they sacrifice and they all work together and they are all rugged and like they haven't showered in two months and they don't care they don't need to sleep I mean it, they're ripped it's it's everything I'm not and so I just I, I love it I I, I mean Think about it. In 20 years, war movies are going to be so sad. They're going to be like a group of 23-year-olds drinking Mountain Dew from their parents' basements on their PlayStation 6s launching drones halfway around the world. And that's going to be war movies in 20 years from now. They're going to make me look strong like I'm a throwback. So it's going to be really sad. So enjoy them while, while they're out there. Now, in all the war movies that I've seen, I've seen guns, and I've seen knives, and I've seen rockets, and I've seen grenades, and I've seen swords, and I've seen spears, and I've seen bombs, and I've seen bows and arrows. I've seen, you name it, every kind of weapon that's available. You know what I've never seen? I've never seen a hulking warrior go up to a city, rip its gates out of their foundation, and start swinging them around, just trying to take people out. Why? Because gates are defensive. They're a defensive mechanism to thwart those who are coming to attack. So when Jesus tells Peter, on this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What Jesus is talking about is that for those of us who have had an encounter with Jesus, we are to be on the offensive. We are to take the message of love. We are to take the message of hope. We are to take the message of peace. We are to take the message of truth to those who have not love, to those who do not know hope, to those who have no peace. And in a world that is literally crumbling in front of us, in front of our very eyes, there is no shortage of opportunity for our message to ring true and to ring loud. 
We, as people who follow Jesus, must be the most loving, must be the most hopeful, must be the people who are full of truth and be full of peace. And we need to carry that message and that change in our lives out to this world that is in desperate need of love, that is in desperate need of peace, that is in desperate need of hope, and in desperate need of truth. We need to stop sitting by idly thinking that we are defeated as we look at our culture. Instead, it must be our rallying cry. All the more reason as our culture increasingly is not loving to personify love as we go. For those of you who follow Jesus, stop living defeated lives. God has not called you to be defeated. God has not called you to live in fear. Spoiler alert. Jesus wins. And if you're his, the war is already over. And it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged his disciples to tell no one that he was Christ. Okay, what? What? <laughs> like, I, I was right there. Right there with you, Matthew. I think, I, I think I'm getting what Jesus is doing here. And then, hey, guys, just don't tell anybody about me. What? Why? This is troubling at face value. No, let's tell people. Like, you're God. The reality is this. Jesus' work was not yet done. He had not yet gone and paid the price for our sin. He had not yet risen again on the third day. His work was not yet done, and he knew that people already didn't understand. How much more they wouldn't understand. But we, we get to look back. And Jesus has given us different directions. In fact, he commissioned us after he died for our sins, after he paid the price for my rebellion and my mistakes, after he rose again three days later, after he spent some time appearing to over 500 witnesses and back with his friends, after he made his friend who denied him three times breakfast, as he goes to heaven, he says, go tell everyone all over the world to follow me. And so Lakeside, this is our rallying cry. The most important question that must universally be answered is who is Jesus? And we have an opportunity to help point people to the answer. We have an opportunity to help point people to the truth. So let's make sure in our lives that we personify love. Let's make sure in our lives that we are people who are full of hope, that we conduct ourselves with peace, that we are truthful people, and we never miss an opportunity to point people to Jesus. Hell will not prevail. It may seem like it is. It may at times seem hopeless. Hell will not prevail. We carry love. We carry truth. We carry peace. We carry hope. Because we carry Jesus. And so the question I want to ask you today, personally, first, is who is Jesus? You might be here because your parents made you. You might be here because you're just trying to earn brownie points with your spouse. You might be here just because you, you don't know what you think, but you're like, I just thought it'd be a good idea to, to show up. I don't know why I'm here. And that's all right. We're glad you're here, regardless of why you're here. We're excited that you're here. And regardless of where you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome here, and we are excited that you are here. 
Just understand whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, you will have to answer the question of who is Jesus. It's required of you. Who is Jesus? If you've come to the place like Peter where you have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is, that he is God, that he loves us, that he came so that we could have a relationship with God, And you've made the decision to put your hope and trust in Jesus to pay the price for the mistakes that you've made. And you're counting on him. And I have another question for you. My question is this. Whose gates are you tearing down? Whose gates are you tearing down? Now, I understand that this can be intimidating. I understand that you can freak yourself out and think, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a pastor. Look at my life, Brian. I'm a wreck and I'm a mess. Congrats, we all are, and it's exciting that you understand that. But here's the deal. The people that God and Jesus had the biggest problem with were the people who thought they had it all together. So you want to go tear somebody's gates down? Tell them your story. Tell them what God has done in your life. You don't have to have a lot of theological points memorized. You don't have to have a full doctrinal statement in your mind. You don't have to, you don't have to like, be able to list all the Bible books in order. You just tell them what God's done in your life. The change that has happened in you. And then you live it out. You be love. You be hope. You be peace. And you be truth. And don't make it harder than it has to be. Don't put the pressure on yourself that you have to have all of this figured out or that your life has to look a certain way. Be honest, be genuine, be real. And point people to Jesus. And it can be as simple as telling your story and as easy as an invitation. Hey, I know you're going through some things right now. I know life's rough. I've been there. This is what I've found. Why not, why not come with me? To Lakeside. And leverage that as an opportunity. To invite someone. Who needs the truth? Who needs hope? Who needs peace? And who needs love? This is our challenge. This must be our DNA. There's one moment, one conversation changed not just Peter's life, but the trajectory in life of every single person who followed Jesus as Jesus unveiled this idea for the very first time. That those who follow him individually are collectively part of something more. And that is the church. So let's make sure that we individually personify these things so that we can collectively as well. God, I pray that you would help us. Be love. Be peace. Be hope. And be truth. 
God, I pray for those who are here who don't really know what they think about you, aren't really sure. And God, I thank you that they're here. And I pray, God, in just some very real, tangible way, this, this week, you would reveal yourself to them. And you would just help them move closer to a conclusion where you change their lives. God, I pray that you would let us each see the opportunities that we have before us with our friends, with our neighbors, with our coworkers. God, that we wouldn't be paralyzed by fear, but we would be eager to personify. And God, that you would change their hearts and you would change their lives. And collectively, God, as Lakeside, that we would point people to you. And so, Lord, I pray right now for the events that are coming up this week, that we would leverage the opportunities that we have to bring people here. And once they come, that they would see the difference in us. Help us be love. Help us be peace. Help us be hope. We point people to you. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.